Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Exploring the Great Indoors, Relevance of the Built Environment to Human Health. I am Robert Castellanos of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider for virtual events, webinars, and advancing scientific collaboration and learning. For more information, please visit labroots.com. Before we start, there are a few instructions. We want to hear from you from this interactive live broadcast. So please ask questions, and you can do this by hitting the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window and typing your comments and questions, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Want a better look? You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you can't hear or see this presentation properly, please let us know by clicking on the support button at the top right or use the Q&A button and we'll make sure to resolve any issues that you may have. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing educational credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your webpage and follow the process to obtain your credits. Well, today we are pleased to present Dr. Roxana Hickey. Dr. Roxana Hickey is a micro ecologist and postdoctoral fellow at the University of Oregon Biology and the Built Environment Center. Her research is motivated by uncovering the causes and consequences of variation in the trillions of microorganisms inhabiting the human body, collectively known as a human biome. At the BioBE Center, she is working with biologists, architects, engineers to study the microbiological relationships between humans and the indoor environments in which we spend most of our lives. This work will ultimately contribute to a greater understanding of the role of the built environment microloom to human health and development. Without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Hickey. Thank you, Robert, for that introduction. And um, I wanna start by thanking the organizers of this um, really cool series. Um, this is a great opportunity for me to be able to share some of my research and um, research from the Biology and Built Environment Center at the University of Oregon. And I also wanna thank um, everyone in the audience today. I know that um, you could be watching the new Apple release of the iPhone right now. So I appreciate you taking the time um, to spend with me and, and hear about some of the research that we have going on at the Biology and Built Environment Center. Um, so the title of my talk today is Exploring the Great Indoors, and I want to take you on a journey through some of the research that we've done um, in the last, over the last six to seven years, exploring um, what the composition of the indoor microbiome is and how that relates to the human microbiome and health. And so to get started, um, I'll just provide a little bit of background about the human microbiome. And I know that this is an area that many of you are familiar with, um, especially those of you in the clinical sciences. And so just to give a very brief overview, the human body is teeming with trillions of microorganisms, including bacteria, fungi, um, viruses, and even eukaryotic microbes. Um, we find bacteria and other microbes throughout um, every, almost every body site that we've um, evaluated. And so we find lots of them in the gut microbiome. We also have microbes living on the skin environment, the oral cavity, urogenital tract, pretty much everywhere we look, there are microbes. Um, current estimates indicate that there's probably around 39 trillion microbial cells in a single human body. And so this constitutes somewhere between one to 3% of the total of your total body mass. And so it's a pretty significant proportion of what makes you, you. And as we continue to learn more about the functions of these microbes in human health, um, we're coming to realize that they play a really significant role in both maintaining health and preventing disease. Um, but even still, after 10 to 15 years of really intensive research on the human microbiome, we're still only beginning to understand the many functions that they serve for us. And so just to highlight a few bullet points of um, some of the areas in which the microbiome is important to human health, I've just listed a couple here, and I'm sure that you'll see talks throughout this lab root series um, touching on, on some of these in more depth. Um, but microbes in our gut, for instance, perform um, metabolic activities that we can't do for ourselves, and so they contribute to our nutrition. 
microbes on our skin and in our gut help protect against um, pathogens and disease. Microbes are important for training our immune system from an early age and helping um, to prevent allergies later in life. And then more recent research has shown um, some interesting connections between the microbiome and development of disease and also development of our cognitive behavior and mental health. And so I'm not going to get into any of these areas today, but I just wanted to highlight that this is a very broad field and there's a lot of active research happening right now to try to explore the role of the human microbiome um, in human health. And so as we've um, learned more and more about the human microbiome over the last 10 to 15 years, um, we're increasingly recognizing that microbes don't only live in and on our bodies, but also in all of the areas around us. So we, we know that if we go into the outdoors, we find microbes in soils and on plants and on other animals. And so we're beginning to appreciate more and more that microbes really are all around us. We live in a microbial world. And the environment that we're really interested in here at the Biology and the Built Environment Center is the environment of, of buildings. And so um, humans in developed countries spend a vast majority of our lives um, indoors up to 90% of our time. I mean, if you think about what you're doing right now, you're probably sitting at a desk watching me speak on your computer and you're in an indoor environment being exposed to microbes that are circulating in the air around you. And so given that we spend so much of our lives indoors, um, this makes for a really interesting and important ecosystem to study, to understand how it might be shaping um, both our human microbiome and our health status. So the Biology and the Built Environment Center um, is based at the University of Oregon. And this is a synergetic collaboration between multiple groups of biologists and architects and engineers um, in, in both Jessica Green's laboratory, um, which is the lab that I work in, and also the Energy Studies and Buildings Laboratory, which is a consortium of architects and engineers. And at the BioBE Center, we perform research to understand the impacts of architectural design on microbial ecology of the indoors in order to inform sustainable design of buildings and also promote healthy conditions while conserving energy in building design. So the BioBE Center, um, as I said, is based at the University of Oregon, and it was founded in 2010 by Dr. Jessica Green, along with Dr. Brendan Bohannon and Charlie Brown, also at the University of Oregon. And um, we're funded by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. So we're on our second grant cycle right now. And today the center is um, co-directed by Dr. Green and also Dr. Kevin Vanden Weimellenberg, who is an um, architect in the Energy Studies and Buildings Laboratory. So the um, ultimate goal of the research that we do at the BioBE Center is to be able to optimize the design and operation of buildings in order to promote human health and environmental sustainability. And so when we think about the ways that we design buildings and design projects to understand the relationship between building architecture and the human microbiome, there's kind of three um, interacting areas that we're interested in. And so these are microbial ecology, human health, and building design and energy. Now today I'm gonna to be focusing more on the bottom portion of this triangle, looking at the interactions between architectural design and microbial ecology, um, but we're ultimately interested in connecting all three of these together. And so to motivate the work that I'm gonna show you today, this is um, kind of the central question motivating the research that we do. And this is how does the design use and occupancy of buildings influence the indoor microbiome? And so I'm gonna highlight results from several studies that have been published since um, the initiation of the BioBE Center. And I've split these into three um, categories here. And so let me see if I can get my pointer out here. Oh, there we go. And so the first couple of studies here um, illustrate how architectural design impacts the composition of the indoor microbiome. The next couple of studies that I'll show um, talk about the ways in which humans interact with the built environment. So either through direct contact with the environment or some of the chemicals that we might apply indoors. And then finally, um, the last most recent study that I'll present shows how humans are contributing directly to the built environment simply by occupying a space. And so all of these studies represent different ways that we're trying to understand how um, human intervention, both through building design and also just through our behaviors and habits, how we influence the composition of this indoor microbiome that we're living with constantly. Um, so before I get into the results, I should tell you a little bit about how we actually gather our data and measure um, the composition of these microbial communities. And so most of you who are familiar with microbiology know that um, most microbes are not easily distinguished just by looking at them. We have very similar 
um, morphologies and cell types, and even um, with a litany of biochemical tests, it can still be very difficult to distinguish bacterial species um, in particular from each other. And in addition to that, we know that the vast majority of microbial life is not easily cultivated in the lab. And so this precludes us from being able to study all of the microorganisms that live both in the body and in the environment um, in, in culture. Uh, this is a, an interesting figure from a recent um, revision to the tree of life, kind of centered on the microbial diversity um, of, of life. And so this, is, uh, this was published by Hug and colleagues um, earlier this year. And let me just get my annotation tools here. And so what you see on this top portion of the graph here, this represents all of the microbial diversity of um, nearly 100 bacterial phyla that have, that have had genomes sequenced. And one thing to notice here is that all of these red dots that you see throughout the tree, those represent genomes from bacterial or other organisms that have never been cultivated in, in the lab. So we see that there's this extreme diversity of microbial life but most of it we still haven't even been able to study in culture. And so this is why it's really important to have other means of um, accessing the diversity of microorganisms. And then just to point out where we are, we are way down here in a tiny branch in the eukaryotes. And so really microbial life is um, incredibly diverse and vast. And because of that, this um, means that we need to rely on other means of, of accessing the diversity in these communities. And so the typical approach that we take, and um, this, is, this is typical of most um, modern uh, microbiome studies today, is we do a cultivation independent workflow. And so this means that we start with our environmental sample, whether it's um, a soil sample or a dust sample, and then we extract DNA directly from the sample. We amplify um, marker genes, and in the case of bacteria, we're most commonly targeting the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. And then we sequence that um, so that we get DNA sequences and perform bioinformatic analyses that allow us to um, determine what types of bacteria or fungi or other organisms we have in a sample. So today, everything that I'll show you is based, um, for the most part, on 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing. And so this targets um, bacteria. So I'll mainly be focusing on bacteria today. Um, but we do have other research with um, fungi and um, we're, we're starting to branch out into other domains of life as well. Okay, so now to get into some results, um, I'll start with the design focus results. So how does architectural design influence the microbiome of the built environment? And the first study that I'll share with you um, is the first study that was done um, by, by members of the BioBE Center. And so this work was led by Dr. Stephen Kemble, who was at the time a postdoc at the BioBE Center, and he's now an associate professor at the University of Quebec in Montreal. And so the question that Steve asked was, how does um, the ventilation source, so the source of air circulating through a building, how does that influence the composition of the air microbiome, specifically in hospital rooms? And the reason um, they decided to start here was because if you think about um, the relevance of the built environment to human health, one of the first types of buildings that should come to mind is a hospital. You have a lot of people who are recovering from illness, you know, staying here. And so it's really important to assess how the composition of the air microbiome and also the indoor air quality uh, might be contributing to, you know, whether a patient becomes more or less susceptible. And so in this study, um, they had researchers occupy patient rooms um, on a patient bed for a few hours at a time while they sampled air. And so I'm going to show you um, a bit more of the experimental details on that. Um, first of all, the, the study was performed at this hospital in Portland, Oregon, Providence Milwaukee Hospital. You can see that it's a fairly standard looking building, modern building with um, uh, HVAC circulation throughout the building, which is typical of most commercial buildings. And so here's a layout of a um, typical patient room. And so over here, you can see the patient bed. Um, you have the window off to the side here and then a bathroom over here. And so these, these red um, boxes here are showing the air intake on this end and then the air exhaust on this end. And so um, typically air is circulating through the room through mechanical ventilation, which as I said, is, is common for um, commercial buildings. And um, let me just zoom in a little bit on this. So there were two different uh, treatments that uh, the researchers tested in this study. They wanted to compare mechanically ventilated rooms with window ventilated rooms. And so what they did was for mechanical ventilation, they circulated the air as you would normally have it circulating throughout the room, coming in through the ceiling plenum and out through um, the exhaust. 
And during that sampling, um, they had two air collectors set up um, right at the patient bed here. And so these are liquid air impingers that are drawing air through um, this device and collecting uh, the sample, the particles in the air, collecting that inside on a filter. And so that was for mechanical ventilation. And then for window ventilated rooms, what they did was they blocked off the mechanical supply um, of air with this device that you see up here. So this is just channeling the, what the air that would normally be coming into the room through the HVAC system back out through the window. And instead they're just ventilating straight through the window and, and letting out uh, fresh outdoor air into the hospital room. You can see these little yellow telltales these are um, flags that we use to measure airspeed and velocity. And then these anemometer probes, this is another device, um, a sensor that's used to measure airflow. And in addition to these two treatments, so mechanical ventilation and window ventilated rooms, they also collected air directly outside of the building to capture um, kind of the source air microbiome that could be coming in through the window. And so they set up the same types of air samplers on the ground just outside of the air intake to the building. Okay, so the first result that I'm going to show you um, illustrates that the bacterial diversity differs with respect to each of those different air sources that I just told you about. So on the y-axis here, we have something called phylogenetic diversity. And what this represents is um, the, the overall diversity of different types of um, distantly related bacteria within the sample. And so you can see here that in the outdoor um, air samples, the phylogenetic diversity is much higher than what was observed indoors in the mechanically ventilated rooms. And what this means is that we're sampling a greater variety of different types of bacteria outdoors than we are indoors. And what's really interesting is that if you compare that to the window ventilated rooms here in the center, it's intermediate between the air, the mechanically ventilated rooms and the outdoor air. So this suggests that we're bringing in you know, enough of the outdoor air that we're, we're getting a greater variety of different types of microorganisms um, that is elevated above the mechanically ventilated rooms, but not quite as high as outdoors. And so another thing that um, they looked at in this study was not only the phylogenetic diversity, but also what the composition of that, um, the air microbiome was in those different samples. And since this was a hospital, um, one of the things they were interested in is whether um, the mechanically ventilated rooms were tending to accumulate more human associated bacteria and specifically bacteria that could be potential pathogens. And so what they did was they um, compared the DNA sequences that they obtained from all of the bacteria and compared them to a database of known human pathogens. And if they were greater than 97% similar to a known pathogen, they classified it as a potential pathogen. And so now what you're seeing here, we've got that phylogenetic diversity plotted on the X axis. And so that's what I showed you in the previous plot. And then on the y-axis now, we have the proportion of bacterial sequences in each of those um, samples that was closely related to a human pathogen. And so now what you can see is that in the mechanically ventilated rooms, even though the overall phylogenetic diversity of those um, communities is lower, they have a greater proportion of, um, of organisms that are closely related to human pathogens. And again, you see the outdoor air um, on this end, so there's a lower proportion. And then in the middle, again, we have intermediate proportions um, in the window ventilated communities. And so again, this is illustrating how just by changing the type of air circulation in the building, this can alter the composition and the diversity of um, the indoor air microbiome. And so as I said, this was um, the first study that was done at the BioBE Center just to understand how something like an architectural feature such as ventilation could impact the indoor microbiome. And this was um, focused at a room level. And so after this um, study, the researchers were interested in expanding this and doing a much larger experiment. And so as a, as a follow-up study, um, they asked the question, what factors drive my indoor microbiome composition at the building scale? And so what I'm gonna show you in the next several slides um, is a compilation of a couple of different studies. And this was led again by Dr. Steve Kemble and also Dr. James Meadow, who was also a postdoc at the center and is now working at Phylogen. And so for this um, study, the building that you see in the background here is the Lillis um, Business Complex at the University of Oregon. Uh, this is a building that was completed in 2003, and it's a really interesting building to study um, for architectural and microbial ecology purposes, because um, for one, it uses a lot of sustainable design features and different ventilation strategies that allow us to tease apart some of these um, architectural variables that we think may be impacting microbial ecology.
And so here's a um, schematic diagram of that building, the Lillis Business Complex. And so you can see that there's four main floors throughout the building. Um, the bottom two floors here are dedicated primarily to classroom spaces. And so you have larger open spaces that are gonna have greater occupancy with students. Um, and then on the top two floors here, these purple rooms are faculty member offices. And so you have smaller rooms that are occupied probably by one person at a time for the most part. Um, and so this is, this is interesting to be able to study different space types in this environment. And then finally in blue here, of course, we have bathrooms on every level. Um, through the center portion of this, oops, let me see if I can get my highlighter back again. Through the center portion of the building here, you see this large um, open atrium. And so this is another great feature of this building uh, where you have this large open space where air can exchange and, and flow through um, from the bottom floor up to the top floor. Okay, so in this study, um, the researchers collected several different types of samples. One of them was to sample individual rooms, so those classrooms and offices and bathrooms. And um, we think of this as kind of short-term scale sampling. And so we're sampling air and surfaces over a short period of time. And what this does is it provides a snapshot of what types of bacteria were present at, you know, a very, in a very short period of time. On the other hand, they also collected vacuum dust samples from surfaces all throughout the building. And so this, when we think of dust, I mean, it's particles settling out um, from the air over time. And so this represents more of a time integrated sample of, of the microbiome in the building over you know, the course since, it was, um, since the dust was last disturbed. And so you can see in these photos here that they sampled not only the floors, but also ledges and um, tops of mirrors and shelves and doorways to get a really comprehensive sample of the dust microbiome in this building. Um, they sampled nearly 300 different spaces throughout the building and it was that um, covered approximately 93% of the um, building area. Okay, so with those two types of samples, um, we're interested in asking again what the effect of different types of ventilation are on the building and also what the effects of space type and um, layout of the building are. So I'm going to show you some results from that. Okay, so this first result is looking at the dust microbiome. So these are all of those vacuum samples that they collected throughout the building. And um, this diagram that I'm showing you here is an ordination diagram. And so what this shows you, um, each point here represents a single dust sample that was collected from um, a different space type. And so you can see the rooms over here. We had classrooms, storage rooms and mechanical rooms, hallways, offices, and restrooms. And so the way to interpret this is that the, the closer in space two points are to each other, that means that their overall microbial community composition was more similar than to other points in this plot. And so if we break this down and look at these five major types of spaces, um, we see that there's differences in both the composition and the variance observed in the composition in each of these room types. And so for instance, you see all of the restroom samples down here are clustered um, fairly closely together, suggesting that they're um, quite different from many of these other space types. It turns out that many of the microbes that were dominant in this um, environment were human gut associated microorganisms, not too surprising. And then in other um, areas, the so storage and mechanical rooms, you see a lot of different types of um, communities here. And that could potentially be reflective of these spaces being accessed less frequently by fewer people. And so um, you don't have as much mixing between um, the air as you might in, in a restroom where you have a lot of traffic going in and out. And so what they found was that um, looking at how these space types fall apart on this diagram here, the higher human traffic areas tend to cluster down here. So hallways, classrooms, and restrooms. And then the lower traffic areas, storage rooms, and offices cluster up here, but have a lot more spread. And so this was an interesting result that illustrates how just by um, looking at different types of rooms in a building, you can find different types of microbial communities. In addition to that, um, a really interesting feature of the Lillis building is that the offices on the um, top two floors have a mixed ventilation system. So all of the offices on the north side of the building have operable windows and can um, receive outdoor air through natural ventilation. And then the south side, um, shown here in red, the south side offices have your typical mechanically ventilated um, air supply. And so in this diagram, what we're showing is um, the difference, the, the 
primary bacterial taxa that are contributing to differences in the air between mechanically ventilated and window ventilated rooms. And something that was um, intriguing was that in the window ventilated rooms, a lot of the bacteria that were contributing to differences from the mechanically ventilated rooms were organisms that we commonly find outdoors and in soil. And so just like we saw in the hospital study, that's reflective of exchange of that outdoor air coming in and mixing with indoor air, introducing a greater variety of um, outdoor associated microorganisms to the environment. And so I mentioned a, a few slides back that um, the Lillis building is really interesting architecturally and it has this large atrium in the center of it. And um, so this is just looking from, from that center of the building and you can see that um, on each of these floors you have hallways coming off of those and each hallway has many rooms connected to them. And so this building also allowed us to look at the effect of spatial um, connections between rooms on the composition of the microbiome. And so what I'm showing here, this is a um, network diagram um, showing the connections between the different types of rooms in the building. And so you don't need to um, look at this in too much detail, but what you have here, each of these nodes or dots represents a room in the building. So all of these little blue ones are offices. These larger red ones are classrooms. Um, these bright green circles are hallways or other open corridors. And um, the bathrooms are here in yellow, I believe. And so what you see between these connections, um, th this represents the area of connection between any two rooms. And so these really broad connections indicate where you have hallways connecting spaces. These really small connections means that there's one door basically linking that office to that hallway. And, and then these big gray circles represent um, outdoor contact with the outdoor environment. And so you can see that this is a pretty complex network of connections and some spaces are more highly connected than, than others. And so what Steve Kemble and colleagues asked was, well, how does this um, spatial architecture of, of layout of rooms relate to similarity in microbial community composition? And so what I have here on the left side here, um, this x-axis is basically a simplified um, version of of the connectedness between any two rooms. And so you can think of it as how many doors are there between any two rooms. And then on the y-axis here, I'm plotting a measure of biological similarity. So the higher this is, that means that the, those communities are more similar to each other um, in, in composition. And so what you see here is an interesting um, decay of similarity the further away um, two spaces get. And this may seem somewhat intuitive um, because as two rooms are, are further spaced apart, they're gonna be experiencing less exchange of the same microbes. And so their communities are gonna become less similar to each other. And what's, what I think is really interesting about this is that this echoes um, patterns that are observed in other areas of ecology where people have gone out and looked at soil communities or plant communities or animals. And you see again, this distance decay pattern as you um, increase space between uh, ecosystems, you have more dissimilarity between the species that inhabit that. And so this suggests that, you know, there's potential to model building ecosystems using ecological approaches of um, distance and similarity. Okay, so the, all of the um, results that I've presented up until this point have shown how um, architectural factor, factors such as ventilation strategy, and um, space type and connections between rooms, all of those can impact the composition of the indoor microbiome and similarity between microbiomes in different spaces. And so now what I wanna to transition to is um, looking at how human interactions with the built environment can also contribute to differences in the indoor microbial communities. And so this first study um, was part of this larger Lillis um, sampling effort. And this was led by Dr. James Meadow and the question that he was asking is how do human interactions with various surfaces, in this case in a classroom environment, how does that shape the composition of the indoor microbiome? And so you can see here on this slide, um, they sampled some areas of desks and chairs, and you'll also see floors and walls. And um, we were interested in, in understanding how the microbial composition varies with respect to these different um, surfaces and also how people interact with those surfaces. And so here's a schematic diagram showing um, the sampling of those classroom surfaces. This is just a top-down view of the classroom. So you can see at the front of the room here, um, this is where the professor would be lecturing. And then you have all of these seats locate and desks around the room facing the front. 
And so each of these little dots represents a sampling location um, and the colors are indicated here. So they sampled chairs, desks, walls over here by the doors and also the floor at each desk. Okay, so here's the result from that. Um, this is showing the differences among those four space types and how it's related to different types of bacteria. So over here, we have a constrained ordination showing that the chairs, floors, walls, and desks um, are different in terms of microbial composition. And then over here, this accompanying graph is showing what types of bacteria um, most explain those differences. And so one thing that was um, really interesting here is that if you focus on the microbes that were found on chairs and on desks, these tended to be organisms that are commonly found in both the human gut and urogenital tracts and also the skin microbiome. And this is not too surprising because we carry those types of organisms you know, on, our, on our bodies. And so when we're interacting with um, the surfaces of desks or sitting on chairs, we're um, presumably uh, depositing some of our microbes there. On the other hand, the floors tended to have um, more organisms that are typical of outdoor soil communities. And then on the walls, um, these were less distinctive of either soil or human and, and more um, types of bacteria that we commonly see just in indoor air. Um, and so this, this is evidence to show that the ways in which we interact with different um, micro environments within the built environment, uh, that we, sh we shape the composition of what ends up there. So another way that we can think about um, our interactions with the environment beyond just our, our you know, direct contact with surfaces is actually the chemicals that we apply indoors. And so this is an area of interest um, of Dr. Erica Hartman and she was a postdoc at the BioBE Center until very recently. She just started an assistant professorship at, the, at Northwestern University. And so she's really interested in understanding how um, the chemicals that we use indoors affects um, the, the microbial composition and also antibiotic resistance in the indoor microbiome. And so um, you may be aware that many of the products that we use both for personal care and even increasingly just um, consumer products like I'm showing here, keyboards and um, pencils and building supplies, many of these um, consumer products are laced with um, antimicrobial chemicals. And um, here's just a table showing one of the most ubiquitous of them. So triclosan, which um, is probably the most notorious of all of the antimicrobials that we use. Um, this is a summary of four different studies that looked at the concentrations of this chemical just in indoor dust. And so you can see um, that nearly 100% of samples um, had detectable levels of triclosan. And um, these are slightly below um, active levels of, uh, of the chemical, but still we're, we're finding a lot of this in these different environments. And so this should be concerning for a few reasons. Um, one is that you know, we're, we're adding antimicrobials to many of these products, um, but it hasn't scientifically been shown that these are um, effective or any more effective at removing um, bacteria than you know, simply using soap and water, for instance. And so it's, it's possible that we're potentially enriching for antimicrobial resistance in the bacteria that live in the indoor environment just by applying, you know, blindly applying these chemicals to the environment. And so these studies, you know, found triclosan in dust, but um, up until this point, no one had asked, well, how does this relate to the microbiome? And so that was Erica's main interest. And so in this study, um, we sampled a different University of Oregon building. This is Gerlinger Hall. Um, this is a much older building than the Lillis building that I showed you earlier. So this building was constructed in 1921 and it's a multi-use um, athletic and classroom facility. So this has classrooms, as you can see on the right here, offices, of course, restrooms, and then also gymnasiums, locker rooms, and um, a swimming pool. And so this represented a really interesting building to do um, the study of antimicrobial resistance on because for one, there are a lot of different space types um, and um, uh, yeah, a lot of opportunity to collect even more dust. And so you can see, uh, ah, sorry, you can see vacuuming here. We, we sampled light fixtures, area rugs, um, bathrooms, nooks and crannies. And we suspect that many of these areas had probably not been cleaned for possibly decades, um, some of these areas were very hard to reach. And so we, we did a comprehensive sampling of the dust microbiome 
in this building. And then what we did with the samples, instead of just looking at the composition of the microbial communities, we saved half of the sample to perform chemical analysis on. And so um, Erica's team led a uh, chemical analysis using liquid chromatography tandem mass spec to look at the concentrations of a variety of different antimicrobial chemicals, including triclosan, in the dust. And then we compared that to the composition of the microbial communities in the dust. In addition to that, um, we also did metagenomic sequencing, which this is a technique that takes into account not just a single marker gene, but actually evaluates all of the DNA in the sample that we um, extract. And so we targeted antimicrobial resistance genes that were present in those communities to try to correlate whether the presence of antimicrobials was correlated with um, an elevated amount of antibiotic resistance genes. And so here I'm showing a couple of results. We did find significant associations between the concentrations of both triclosan and methylparaben um, in association with several groups of antibiotic resistance genes. And so here I'm showing just the top three of these. Um, two of them were these 23S ribosomal RNA methyltransferases. And so these genes um, are involved in antibiotic resistance to several different compounds. We also identified um, a class A beta lactamase shown here. So these are just the three most abundant, but we actually found more than this um, throughout the data. And then what you can see over here, these, each of these plots is showing the relative abundance of that gene in the community um, plotted against the mean chemical concentration of triclosan in that, um, in that community. And so you do see a statistically significant correlation between uh, higher levels of triclosan and higher relative abundance of these antibiotic resistance genes in some samples, but not all samples. And so this um, is, is the first instance where we've been able to correlate uh, the composition of the microbiome and specifically looking at antibiotic resistance genes and connecting that to concentrations of triclosan in dust. And so Erica is currently working on um, a larger follow-up study to this to look at other um, types of buildings and environments to see if this, um, if this pattern exists you know, there as well. But I don't want to alarm you too much. So we also, as part of this study, compared the um, overall abundance of antibiotic resistance genes to other environments that have um, been studied. And so just to orient you with this diagram, this is, uh, these are violin plots, which are basically box plots here where you have the median and the first and third quartiles um, indicated in the boxes here. And so the, these lines on the outside simply represent the distribution of data points along that, that distribution. And so this is from our study. Um, these are the total, basically the total abundance of resistance genes that we identified. Um, and then this is a compilation of several other studies looking at athletic gyms and homes. And then finally over here, this is looking at antibiotic resistance genes in um, a cohort of human microbiome samples. And so we can see that even though we have um, some elevated resistance genes in our sample and also in other built environments, it, it's also still high in the human microbiome. And so we don't fully understand why this is the case yet, um, but this is an important factor to consider when we're thinking about how we apply both antimicrobials in the environment and also antibiotics um, as humans, you know, taking antibiotic medications. These things can potentially have impacts on selecting for antibiotic resistance in the microbiomes that live both in the environment and also in our bodies. And so there's a lot of additional work to be done in this area. This is kind of an emerging um, area of research, but we think it's really important to consider. And so many of you might have heard about this news last week, um, and we think this is good news. The FDA recently recommended that 19 of these antimicrobial chemicals that are commonly used in hand soaps and personal care products, um, these are no longer going to be allowed in the US. And so this does include triclosan. Um, you can visit this link here for more information, but basically they concluded that there wasn't enough scientific evidence to support um, the claim that add addition of these chemicals um, was any more effective than just using soap and water. So we were really happy to see this um, and with you know, timely publication of our, these results were actually just published today um, from, from the study I just showed you. So I encourage you to go look this up in environmental science and technology. Um, yeah, so that's kind of a summary of the, the research that we've done at the BioBE Center over the last um, six years. Oh, sorry, I have one more study. I almost forgot about one of my favorites here. Um, so now at this point, I've shown you how architectural features, including ventilation and space type, can influence the microbiome. I've shown you how interactions with surfaces and application of antimicrobial chemicals could also potentially have an impact. 
And so one of uh, the, the observations that was continually made through all of these studies is that many of the bacteria that we usually observe in the, micro, in the indoor microbiome are bacteria that are commonly associated with humans. And so we presume that the microbes are getting there through humans shedding them into the indoor environment, but no one, no one had actually measured this before. And so um, this last study I'm gonna show you focuses on the human microbial cloud. And what I mean by that is um, the microbial cloud you can think of as all of the particles that are being shed by a person into their surroundings. And those particles have microbes attached to them. And so this work was also led by Dr. James Meadow, and he was asking the question, how do individuals' microbiomes actually colonize the built environment? And so in order to do this, you need um, a fairly well-controlled system or container where you can sample a human microbial cloud. And um, what you see here in this background picture, this is the climate chamber at the Energy Studies and Buildings Laboratory in Portland, Oregon. And so you can see um, two people sitting in chairs here, and I'll show you just in a slide the experimental setup in a little bit more detail. Um, but what you see here, the, there's air samplers set up around each person, so at both head height and lower, closer to the floor. floor. And so we're, we sampled um, the air microbiome around people inside of this closed room. So here's a schematic diagram of what um, this climate chamber looks like. It's about the size of a, you know, a small office. Um, here's a person for scale. And so inside this chamber, uh, all of the walls have radiant um, heating panels. And so you can uh, adjust both the temperature and humidity of the room. There's also this air supply duct where you can control whether what type of ventilation you have, whether it's natural ventilation or um, indoor mechanical ventilation. And um, we also have a ceiling fan up here. So we can really control all of the building variables um, that we think matter for contributing to microbial ecology. And I should mention that this um, climate chamber was originally developed for architectural research on um, thermal comfort research. And so we've kind of co-opted it for our own purposes and using to use it as a giant petri dish of sorts. And so on the right side here, you can, this is um, illustrating the experimental setup of having a person sitting in the chamber. And so what they did was they put up a plastic sheet just across the width of the room here, effectively creating two smaller rooms. And so half of the room remained unoccupied. You see an empty chair here from the top down. And we set up air samplers just around the outside of that chair to collect air. Uh, on the other side of the, of the wall here, we had a person sitting in a chair for two or four hours, and again, collecting air samples. And so we used the same cultivation independent um, techniques of extracting DNA from these air filters and amplifying bacterial genes and then comparing the community composition in those different space types. And what we found was that an occupied space does in fact have a distinct microbiome from that adjacent unoccupied space. And so again, I'm showing some ordination diagrams like I showed you earlier where um, each of these points represents a single air sample that was taken from around the perimeter of one of those chairs. So the triangles represent the unoccupied room and the circles represent the occupied room from three different subjects. There were 10 subjects total in this um, study. And so you can see by looking at each of these that the, um, the occupied spaces are quite distinct from the unoccupied spaces. And on the right side of the diagram here, this is just clustering all of those data points together in a dendrogram. And so you can see that most of the human associated rooms tend to cluster down here, whereas the um, unoccupied spaces cluster up here and have a lot more variability. And so this was the first evidence to really demonstrate that an empty room looks different from a room with a person sitting in it, even just for a couple of hours. And we can zoom in further than that and look at some of the distinguishing bacterial taxa that were identified um, in, the, in those air samples. And so here we're showing, again, another dendrogram cl clustering um, several samples from five different individuals. And then along the bottom here, we have some of the most distinguishing bacteria taxa that we could um, find to, that characterized each of those people. And so you can see that this person A here in orange has a pretty distinct signature of Lactobacillus crispatus, whereas most of the other people here do not. Um, similarly, subject D here, and I should mention that both subjects A and D were female, and so both of these organisms, Lactobacillus and Gardnerella, are organisms that you commonly find in the female urogenital tract, and so we're also detecting those in the air sampled around them. 
Um, so you can see that this individual had a strong signature of this organism that was not as common in the others, and so on and so forth. You can see that for each of these people, you have kind of these unique fingerprints or microbial signatures. And again, this is just from sampled from the air around the people. This isn't from their skin microbiome or you know, sampling the person directly themselves. And so this shows us that just by sampling air, we can identify if a person is in a room. If you're interested in um, hearing a little bit more about this, Science Friday did a piece on this back in January, and here I am sitting as a guinea pig in the climate chamber. Um, so I encourage you to go check that out if you're interested, but we don't have um, time to watch that right now. And so that was a, a fun project that we did with Science Friday. Okay, so uh, just to wrap up, I want to come back to this original question that I started with. How does the design use and occupancy of buildings influence um, the indoor microbiome is where I started. And so all of the uh, research that I've shown you has, has looked at the ways in which we design and use buildings influences the built environment microbiome. And so the work that we're doing now is, is trying to incorporate that top of that triangle and bringing human health and the human microbiome back into the picture. And so the, what I'm really interested in, um, in doing with my research is kind of completing this loop. So we've shown in a lot of ways that humans directly impact the composition of the indoor microbiome, both by shedding their microbes indoors and also by the ways that we design buildings and, and interact with um, surfaces in those buildings. All of that can alter the composition of the indoor microbiome. And so what I'm really intrigued by is how does what's already in that indoor environment contribute back to the human microbiome and ultimately impact human health. And so this is kind of a theme of, of our ongoing research projects now. And I'm just gonna highlight very briefly a couple of these um, just to wrap up. And so these are projects that we're actively working on. Um, hopefully stay tuned in the next few months, we'll have some results um, from each of these. And so one of the, the studies that I'm currently doing, this is a follow-up to that microbial cloud study that I just showed you a few slides back. And in this case, um, instead of just having one person in a room, we have multiple people sit in a room. So you see three chairs here set up. And the questions that we're asking here are, um, first of all, how, how far into space does a person's microbial cloud extend? So if someone is sitting over here, can you still pick up their microbes all the way across the room or are they staying fairly well localized? And secondly, um, when we do have multiple people in a room, are we still able to pick out microbes that distinguish each of these individuals um, from each other in the air that we're sampling throughout the room? And so I think that this research could have really interesting applications for just understanding the dynamics of transmission of microbes from person to person through air. Um, and also there's potential for forensic applications um, where you know, if we can distinguish you know, who was in this room just based on the, the air that we sampled in the room at a given point in time, that could be potentially useful for um, forensic applications as well. And so this work is actively ongoing. Um, stay tuned for results. Another area that we're focusing on right now is looking at a different built environment, the home microbiome. And so we're specifically asking how uh, things that, interventions that humans make to their homes by making weatherization improvements um, to improve energy consumption or um, you know, keep your, your homes warmer during the winter, how does that impact the composition of the indoor microbiome? And so this is a study that we're um, collaborating with uh, members of the Oregon Research Institute and also a company called Inhabit up in Portland that um, puts contractors in touch with homeowners to do these weatherization improvements. And so we're conducting a study um, in two different climatic zones in Oregon, Portland and Bend, which is a high desert region. And we're sampling um, air inside homes using both petri dishes. So these are just collecting settled dust. And also um, we're taking a bunch of indoor air quality measurements for different chemicals that are circulating through the air. And we're asking how um, the act of effectively sealing up the building envelope of your house by performing weatherization improvements, how is that shaping the indoor um, microbiome composition? And so, and finally, there's a, um, third study that I'm working on that I'm really excited about. And this is again, looking at how uh, microbes are potentially being transmitted to humans via the built environment. And so this is work that I'm doing with a graduate student in the lab, Ashley Bateman. And we're comparing three different approaches of how microbes could be getting transferred to humans. And you'll see here that we're working with um, pet dogs and house plants as our sources of microbes. And the reason that we're um, focusing on these is because other research studies have demonstrated that these organisms contribute a lot of microbes to the indoor environment. And that could um, be important for, for 
the composition of our own human microbiome and also health and allergies and that sort of thing. And so we're comparing three different modes of transfer where one of them is direct contact. So can a person pick up microbes just by touching the dog or the house plant? Um, the second one here, we're collecting dust from dogs and plants onto surfaces and then having people interact with that. And so this is asking the question, can, can we actually be colonized just by touching surfaces in the built environment? And then finally, we're looking at transfer of bioaerosols. And so if you're just in the same room as a dog or a plant or a room that was previously occupied by a dog or a plant, does that alone um, colon enable colonization of the human skin microbiome? And so this is work that we're um, actively doing. And I think it's really exciting because this is gonna help to close that loop to try to understand how the built environment microbiome is potentially shaping the human microbiome. And here's just a, an illustration of how we collect some of these samples. And so we have, in this instance, we just got some house plants in here where we're collecting dust samples. Um, and then we transfer either through direct contact or through contact with surfaces. Um, onto the skin microbiome and then we swab over time. So this is just a fun little picture showing how we do some of that work. Okay, so coming back to this um, theme that I started with in the beginning, uh, again, we're really trying to bridge connections between each of these areas um, to try to understand how microbial ecology of the built environment ultimately impacts human health. And so I just wanna close with some um, open questions that we're currently thinking about in our research and one of them, um, this relates to some of those distance decay patterns that I showed you earlier, where we saw that the, the architectural layout of buildings um, relates to similarity in microbial communities. And so this leads us to wonder, are there general laws in building ecology that we can um, predict and model based on architectural variables? Because we know that in uh, much of ecology, we're interested in um, seeking general patterns and principles across space and time. So can we ap apply similar approaches to the building ecosystem? Another big open question, of course, is um, specifically how the built environment and human health are related. And so something that I think is really exciting is that, you know, for most of the history of uh, microbiology and built environment research, um, it's mainly been focused on pathogens and trying to keep microbes out of buildings. But now that we're starting to understand that, you know, we can't, first of all, we can't get rid of those microbes, but also that we need a lot of those microbes um, to be healthy, how can we actually design the built environment to promote human health? And so this is a really big, um, motivating question for us. And then finally, we're interested in understanding the mechanisms of microbial exchange between buildings, air, and people. And so this relates to the microbial cloud work that I just showed you, where we're trying to understand exactly how microbes are making their way both to and from humans and the built environment. And so with that, we've got a few minutes left. I just wanna wrap up and acknowledge a lot of people who have contributed to this work over the years. Um, in the top here, we have the principal investigators, so Jessica Green, Kevin Vandewey Mellenberg, and Charlie Brown, all at the University of Oregon. We also collaborate heavily with um, Curtis Huttenhauer and Rolf Halden, and then a whole bunch of people that have um, contributed to these projects over the years. We get funding from the Alpha P. Sloan Foundation and also the Environmental Protection Agency for the weatherization study that I um, mentioned a few slides back. So we wanna thank both of them. And um, if you're interested in learning more about the research that we're doing, you can follow us at our website, the Biology and the Built Environment Center. You can also email me directly or um, either of the co-directors of the BioBE Center or follow any of us on Twitter. We'd be really excited to hear from you. Um, any questions you have or um, ideas, you know, we, we love doing this research and um, getting feedback from, from people. So thank you um, for, for listening. I think we have just a couple minutes left for questions, but I really um, appreciate you attending my presentation and I'll um, turn it back over to Robert. All right, thank you very much, Doctor, for your presentation. And I'd also like to thank Rab uh, uh, Labroots as well um, for sponsoring um, this particular event. Um, but Doctor, do you have, um, let's see here, one final question that we have here that we have time for um, right now. Let's see. Oh, I do apologize uh, with the time, limited time that we do have. Um, uh, doctor, is there any final statements that you would have at this point in time to wrap things up? Hi, um, 
No, I don't think I have any final statements. I just want to thank everyone again for attending, and I would encourage you to keep an eye on um, built environment research. This is a really um, active and nascent field of study where we're trying to draw these connections between the organisms that live um, indoors with us and the human microbiome. And so um, I'm really excited for the opportunity to be able to work on this. And um, I think that there's a lot of potential for research, particularly with respect to the antimicrobial resistance and also just the transfer of microbes um, from the built environment to the human microbiome. And um, yeah, so I just want to say thank you again to all of our attendees and um, the organizers of the meeting and also my um, advisor, Dr. Green, for giving me uh, the opportunity to, to share this research with all of you today. Thank you. All right, thank you, doctor. And today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through December 7th. You'll receive an email from us alerting you when it is available on demand and posted on labroots.com. You're welcome to forward this announcement to any colleagues that weren't able to join us today. And we thank you very much um, for logging on and participating in today's live webinar. See you next time.